There are a few things more controversial in the low carb world or even health space than LDL cholesterol. And a lot of the controversy comes from just extremes on both sides, probably overstating either the benefit, the harm um, of LDL cholesterol and not focusing on details and nuance. And that's what I want to sort of talk a little bit more about. Now we have three guides that just recently came out at dietdoctor.com. One is sort of a general guide about cholesterol, what it is, the different types of cholesterol, how to sort of see the different the differences between them. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But then two others, is LDL always dangerous? And a specific one about hyper responders, which talks about both sort of the average hyper responder and the lean mass hyper responder for people eating low carb and seeing a rise in their LDL. So I want to talk about all three of these concepts to see if I can give a good overview about um, LDL, at least the way I see it and the way I think maybe more physicians should see it. So first, um, in the what is cholesterol guide, I think one of the big take homes is what should we be looking at that has the best predictive ability for cardiovascular risk. And um, when we talk about LDL, because that gets all the attention, LDL cholesterol is actually probably the worst of the options because we have LDL particle numbers and we have ApoB or apolipoprotein B as well as LDL cholesterol. And the guide goes into the details, but the take home point is ApoB is probably the best. And actually there was just a, the timing is good. There was just this very long podcast with um, Dr. Peter Atia and Dr. Alan Snyderman talking about ApoB. So if you want to know anything about ApoB, that's probably the go-to um, podcast to really learn the details of ApoB. But suffice it to say, ApoB basically um, encompasses the LDL particles and the remnant particles. And remnant particles are the VLDLs and the IDLs, which are inherently very atherogenic, po probably more atherogenic than just LDL itself. So ApoB is nice that it encompasses all of those. Now, LDL particle number is good because it tells you the number of LDL particles, which is more important than just the amount of cholesterol, but it doesn't tell you about the remnants. So that's why in my mind, ApoB is number one, LDL particles number two, and LDL cholesterol is actually the least predictive. So we talk about that in, in the cholesterol guide. We also talk about triglycerides and HDL because those are powerful predictors for cardiovascular risk and extent of cardiovascular disease and markers of good metabolic health. And we also talk about the size of LDL because talking about LDL LDL in general doesn't really tell you much about it, but the size of the particles matters. And here's where there is a little bit of controversy. Small LDL particles um, are definitely more atherogenic than larger LDL particles. Now, does that mean larger LDL particles are not atherogenic at all? No. But if you had to choose whether you want small or large, you definitely want large instead of small um, because smaller is associated with a higher risk of, of cardiovascular disease, plaque formation, MIs, and also associated more likely with metabolic disease. So frequently when you treat the metabolic disease, you can shift the size of the particles. And there are good studies showing that low carb diets are very effective at shifting the size of the LDL particles. And that leads me to the, the next paper about um, LDL low carb hyper responders. Now, the first point is the vast majority of people who start low carb diets for losing weight, if they're obese or overweight, and for treating type two diabetes do not see a rise in their LDL cholesterol. And I can have to repeat that time and time again because there are so many clinicians and physicians out there who are worried that a low carb diet automatically equals higher LDL. But the literature is clear that for most people, following a low carb diet for weight loss or for type two diabetes, they do not see a rise in their LDL. Instead, they see a reduction in their calculated cardiovascular risk. A study by Dr. Sarah Hallberg and her colleagues at Verda showed this, that LDL itself went up about 10%, but ApoB, remember the better marker, ApoB did not change. And the size of the LDL went down, the triglycerides improved, the HDL improved. So when you use the cardiovascular risk calculator, the risk went down. So that's what happens for the average person. Now, of course, there are some outliers where LDL does go up, and these people are termed hyper responders. So the question is, are hyper responders at the same risk as the general population with elevated LDL? And here's where there's been some controversy, because there are some studies that have looked at people with good HDL levels and triglyceride levels and showed them to be at lower risk with elevated LDL. So let me say that again. When LDL was elevated, if HDL was high and triglycerides were low, they were at lower risk of cardiovascular disease. This was seen by um, a study in the Copenhagen Men's Study. This was seen 
uh, in a, a reevaluation of the Framingham study. This was even seen in the 4S trial, um, looking at treating people who've had heart attacks with simvastatin. Now, these trials were not designed to look at this outcome, right? So it's a, a secondary analysis, a retrospective analysis of trials that were already done, um, which does weaken the evidence a little bit, but there, the suggestion is there. Well, on the other side, recently, uh, Deirdre Tobias on, posted a very interesting uh, exercise she did on Twitter, uh, where she went through uh, the women's health study and, and looked at triglycerides and HDL and hemoglobin A1C and showed that higher LDL still correlated with all-cause mortality. Now, hopefully she's going to publish that and we're going to have her on um, to interview to talk to her about that as well, because I'd love to see that in, in more detail. But the point is neither one of these answers the question, right? None, neither one of these proves the question because these trials weren't designed to study that. And so they were. it was just a sort of a reevaluation of the data and we have data on both sides. But here's another interesting question that I have to ask. Does the reason why LDL is elevated matter? So when you look at people who are following standard American diets, high carb diets, you know, average diets, and they have markedly elevated LDL above 190, the majority of those people are going to likely have familial hypercholesterolemia or, you know, a genetic predisposition to having high LDL because there's not some other reason that we can tell that they have it. But when you're eating low carb and you have a high LDL, then you can hypothesize that there could be another reason or mechanism. And I emphasize hypothesize. It's not proven yet, but this is where Dave Feldman uh, has been very influential in, in talking about his theories and his hypotheses and, and trying to design experiments to test it. So the question is, if there is a different mechanism, so in familial hypercholesterolemia, the, the uh, receptors basically aren't able to clear LDL from your system. So the LDL sticks around a lot longer and um, accumulates higher because your body can't clear it. In eating low carb, is it because your body needs the energy so you're creating more um, VLDLs with triglycerides in them to deliver them you use up those VLDLs quickly because you're using the triglycerides for fuel, and then those eventually become LDL. So is that a very different scenario physiologically than familial hypercholesterolemia? We don't know, but that's the hypothesis. And that's where um, it breaks down looking at studies that didn't pay any attention really to familial hypercholesterolemia. And if it's truly like one in 250 people, which is what a lot of the literature suggests, then there are going to be a, a high number of people with FH in these studies. So one of the things I thought was really interesting about the reaction to Deirdre Tobias's um, posts on Twitter was they were saying, oh, now the low carb people are going to move the goalposts and, and say um, that it wasn't a low carb study, so it doesn't matter. But that's not moving the goalpost. That's just, unfortunately, somebody not understanding the potential difference in mechanism. Now, if all you're concerned about is HDL and triglycerides, yes, that showed contrary evidence to what other studies show. So there's, you know, it's not conclusive either way because we have evidence on both sides. And that's frequently what happens with these sort of secondary analyses in trials that weren't designed for it. But the second question is if there's a different mechanism to the elevated LDL, and that's what we don't know. So the other thing is, how does this infect, affect our interpretation of LDL? So it's clear in the general population, in the studies that have been done, higher LDL correlates with higher risk of heart disease and higher risk of death. That's pretty uncontroversial at this point in terms of the majority of the science. But we have to understand the majority of the science was in your average person, you know, likely overweight with some metabolic dysfunction. So one of the questions I wonder is, you know, do we have to adjust our um, targets for what is dangerous and what deserves treatment in people who are metabolically healthy or people who have elevated LDL for other reasons? And here's the reason why I bring that up, because the guidelines are very clear. Any LDL above 190 milligrams per deciliter needs a statin, needs treatment according to the guidelines. It's very clear. But I would postulate that maybe it makes a difference, you know, what your metabolic health is. Maybe it makes a difference what the etiology of your elevated LDL is before having that knee-jerk reaction. Because you can take, I've seen so many patients who, you know, their LDL is maybe 195, 198, and I put them in that cardiovascular risk calculator, and it won't give you um, uh, an actual risk if it's above 190, but I make it 189, right? So I move it maybe, you know, six, seven milligrams per deciliter, and I, I make it 189, and their risk is so low. Their risk is can be down to like 2% on a number of these patients. 
but that difference of six milligrams per deciliter in these calculators makes a difference. So that just sort of shows the absurdity of this absolute cutoff rather than seeing the overall picture. So I guess my point is, can't ignore LDL. We should be focusing on ApoB and LDLP more, but we can't ignore them by any means, but we should be putting them in a context. And we shouldn't be sort of promoting it as black or white, good or bad, ignore or treat, but really looking at, at the whole picture. Now, the other thing is, wh what is the degree of elevation we need to be concerned about? And this is sort of the analogy to the heterozygous FH or the homozygous FH. So homozygous FH is where both, both alleles um, are, have the mutation, so you really have almost no functioning LDL receptor ability to remove LDL, and you get astronomically high um, LDL levels, 500, 600, 700, and people have heart attacks um, and, and die at young ages, okay? And that's, that's a devastating condition. Then there's heterozygous FH, where you have one allele with a mutation and one allele without. Usually, the values are in the 200s for LDLs, although you certainly can see them higher. Um, and in that setting, it's a very different ballgame. There's still a higher risk of developing uh, cardiovascular disease than the general population, but much different than homozygous. So it shows that the absolute degree matters. So does that matter for low carbers? Well, that's interesting because now we have sort of your average hyperresponder and your lean mass hyperresponder. And we had that podcast um, with Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz and Adrian Sotomoto and Trocolasian about their recent paper about lean mass hyperresponders. You can go back and listen to that. But there you also have sort of like two cutoffs where the, the, the I guess you can say, basic hyperresponder usually has values in the 190, 200, 220, 230 range. And the lean mass hyperresponder on average gets up in like the 3, 400 range or certainly can. There's obviously some crossover. So the question is, is there a difference between those? And again, we don't know. And that's what um, there's currently a study going on um, using CT angiograms um, to evaluate that. So if you're interested in learning more about that, citizensciencefoundation.org is the place to go for that. And again, our guides go into some more details about the theories behind this and about some of the evidence behind it um, and the different potential mechanisms of why LDL goes up and why that might matter. But the point is like, the point is we don't know. And that's uncomfortable for clinicians. And I totally get that. I would never fault a clinician for saying, since we don't know, we have to lower your LDL. That's totally reasonable from a clinician standpoint because we don't know that it's safe and the clinician's duty is to treat you as best that they know how. But the other part is valuing the, uh, the opinions and the wants of the patient themselves while educate them as much as possible. So um, there are things you can do to lower LDL while still being on a low carb diet. And that could be reducing your saturated fat intake and focusing more on the monounsaturated. It could be increasing your fiber intake and it could be increasing carbs, either cycling them or increasing them on a daily basis. So maybe you don't need to be less than 20 grams of carbs, but you could be 50 or 60 grams of carbs, high quality carbs, and still see all the benefits of a low carb diet. Those are other options. And we go into those in detail in the guides as well. And then of course, there's medications as an option, right? If you if you really want to stay on your low-carb diet for other reasons and be in, keto, uh, be in ketosis and, and not do some of the other dietary changes, which is perfectly reasonable, then you could take a medication to lower your LDL. So in a way, you're sort of treating your metabolic health and other conditions with your low-carb diet and you're treating your LDL with a medication. That's reasonable too. We shouldn't vilify medications to say they're always evil. Now, it's, it's true that we don't know the outcomes in this specific subset that treating with medications helps. There's a lot we don't know. We have to acknowledge that and allow for variations in care depending upon the individual and the physician. But we also have to acknowledge that statins are not the only drug out there, right? And again, statins are overplayed in terms of their safety and they're overplayed in terms of their harm. Um, I think there's extremes on both sides and the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Um, but they've been around for for decades. And it's true, on average, they are a safe medication, although with side effects that need to be monitored. They're not side effect free by any stretch of the imagination, but they're things that you can usually monitor. But there are other options. And one of my favorites I just have to put out there is Zetia. So I want clinicians to hear this, that you know, the knock against Zetia is that in studies it lowers LDL by like 15 to 20%. It's not as well studied as statins, although there are there is data to show it can reduce outcomes when combined with statins. 
But here's my personal clinical experience, not published, not evidence-based, but my personal clinical experience is people following low-carb diets. Zetia is far more effective. I'm sorry, azetamibe. I shouldn't use the brand name. Azetamibe is far more effective than in the general population. So if in the general population, it reduces LDL by 15 to 20%. In low-carb eaters, it's usually 40 to 50%. So it's much more effective. And that's why for people who do want medications, and are wary of statins, I think azetamibe is a perfectly good choice. Again, not evidence-based, hasn't been studied in this specific population, but if your goal is lowering LDL while maintaining your low-carb lifestyle, I think it's a pretty good choice. So I want clinicians to hear that, and please mention it to your clinicians as, as another option. And then lastly, another point to mention is that what are the other risks, right? High blood pressure, family history, uh, history of smoking, type 2 diabetes, um, what is your LP little a? Uh, what is your coronary calcium score or your carotid intima media thickness test? Any one of these things isn't going to be conclusive, but uh, the combination of them can really help better risk stratify, especially a coronary calcium score. Now, some of these things may not be thought of by your doctor, may not be paid for by your insurance, but if you really want to know a, a more comprehensive cardiovascular risk, I think clinicians should be promoting these um, for to get more information. But again, the problem is when we're in a scenario where data for this specific subset doesn't exist and we have to default to the guidelines, which you know are the bell curve for the general population, it may not apply to the individuals. And that's an uncomfortable situation for a lot of patients and for a lot of clinicians. And I can't fault either one for decisions that they make based on their own goals, their own preferences, and their own experience, either clinically or personally. So I don't know if you were expecting to say to, for me to come to a conclusion saying, yes, it's harmful, no, it's not, treat it, don't treat it, but no, we can't come to that conclusion. But what I was hoping to do in this video and in the guides that we've published at dietdoctor.com is give, give an overview of the topic of LDL, of hyperresponders, of lipids and cholesterol in general, what it can mean in the low-carb subset, what it can mean in the metabolic healthy subset, what we know, what we don't know, and different options for ways to proceed. So I hope this was helpful. Please um, leave us some comments because I always love to hear from you. And I know this is really controversial. And I know there's a, a lot of um, uh, evidence and opinions on both sides of the story. And all we can try to do is synthesize the evidence that's out there as best we can because we're in a, this specific zone is, is kind of an evidence-free zone, but there's lots of evidence that exists in different spheres um, in different areas. So hopefully this was helpful both for individuals and clinicians. Um, and we look forward to hearing more from you um, at dietdoctor.com and here on Diet Doctor News on YouTube. Thanks a lot, everybody.